All right, Dr. Luke, thank you so much for being a guest on Wicked Smart Golf today. Really excited to talk with you about uh, practice, speed, and a lot more. I appreciate you having me on. It's going to be fun, Michael. Yeah, yeah, man. It was really cool to meet you uh, at the PGA show. So I, I did a little recap for my audience uh, when I was when I was there, and uh, you're definitely one of the guys I was very excited to meet. Uh, obviously, we know Scott Fawcett, a mutual friend there, and it was cool mm-hmm. to see him at your guys's booth. And uh, yeah, just want to say like congrats for for all you're doing. I know it's uh, not easy starting a, a business like that, and uh, the PGA show obviously looked like a, a huge success. So uh, from one entrepreneur, just wanted to say congrats on that, man. Yeah, no, cool. It's been a fun ride. You know, we started Ripstick four years ago, and it's been a fun experience for us. And there's a lot of different different ways, you know, a young business can go. But we've been really happy with uh, our growth and connecting with people like you and Fawcett, and and the journey's been fun. Yeah, I was gonna say, like I said, you had some big shoes to fill there. Scott's the number one downloaded episode here. You know, he always <laughs> uh, always gets people riled up. And, yeah. And, uh, yep. Yes, and he he had a big crowd at your booth though, so it was working right. Yeah, yeah. He stopped by and did a couple of, you know, like little short sessions and, and talked to, to a couple of folks. People are very interested in that course management side of it. And I think the impact he's had on really, um, yeah, just how people play the game. Like it is definitely filtered in at almost every level. People are making, I think, different choices, the whole idea of hitting more drivers. And, you know, and that's why that probably is the top podcast is people understand that there's a lot of easy things to be gained just by playing smarter. Yeah, exactly. And that's why that's why I started Wicked Smart Golf a few years ago mm-hmm. to uh, to help people, you know, just make some simple decisions and not get bogged down uh, as much so much with, you know, just going down the rabbit hole of, of swing changes and things. So before we get into Ripstick and, and all that you're doing, we got to rewind to your playing career and how you got started, because I read a story uh, about your uh, background in the game and I thought it was super cool. You did not uh, start playing until you're 13. And then you mm-hmm. were a scratch golfer by 16 with 600 plus rounds under your belt in that time. Yeah, man, I played a lot of golf once I was kind of hooked into it. So my grandpa kind of taught me a couple of things. I, I played a lot of sports growing up and I was just obsessed with like ball sports, you know, so any, any sport with a ball I was, I was into. So it came to me pretty naturally by the time I was 13 and my grandpa's getting me out on the course a couple of times, like the physics of impact and understanding the spin was really fun. I loved curving the ball. And that was the really the first golf lesson I ever had. And that was still probably the 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 only golf lesson I had before I turned pro was my grandpa said, Hey, if you want to want to curve it, you know, if you want to hook it, swing inside out, close the face, it's going to hook and then learn to slice it and kind of go the other direction. So he taught me those skills. And then I remember him saying, All right, Luke, so uh, you can hook it and slice it. Now you spend the rest of your life figuring out straight. And so I was a very much external cue sort of golfer. I could curve it both ways, but straight was always hard for me. Um, and I had no idea how bad my swing was. I was super steep and like these wedges would come in with really toe deep divots. And I had a really upright uh, kind of impact uh, dynamic lie angle. And I didn't even know how bad it was. But at the time, I, you know, I graduated, graduated high school as like a plus two and then graduated college as like a plus 4.6. And I had no idea how bad my swing is. And I turned pro and then I go get a lesson, my first lesson of my life. And the pro was a great guy, Gary Greenquist at Minicata. He's like, boy, Luke, you're, you're kind of steep. Uh, maybe we should do some work on this. So, you know, I, I was one of those guys where I, I was not, I think, a natural in terms of developing good mechanics, but I got the ball in the hole. And um, to this day, um, it, always, it, it drove my philosophy of teaching, too. You know, and you talk a lot about what can we do to get better at scoring, getting the ball in the hole, and then how do we work on mechanics? And those are kind of two separate things. And understanding how do you teach those well was really what led me down the academic route I went towards. Yeah, I was I was going to say, like, I mean, just for people to even understand, like, how good that is to go to be a, a plus two in high school. I mean, I, I always joke, like, I had the steepest learning curve in golf when my first uh, tournament freshman year, I shot a 124. Uh, first wow. tournament senior year, shot a 74. So I had a nice little 50 shot improvement in there. Uh, wow. But yeah. It was nowhere near you. So I don't think I had 600 rounds either. So like, I just have to ask, like when you were playing as a kid, were you just like always playing or were you practicing a little bit of both? Uh, what, what made you like so excited to be out there? Cause I feel like when you're a kid and you're just getting started, mm-hmm. you know, that's really when it's like so fun and, uh, it's not that yeah. serious or it's not life or death. Like we kind of make it as adults. Right. I mean, I was, uh, the course I was at, um, I would ride my bike too. It was, it was first the legacy golf club and I would just ride my bike, have my club on my shoulders. And it was like a mile over there. 
Um, and the range was not free. So I would play a lot. And then I started working at the course and actually we started going to the, the country club and I'd, I'd ride three miles to the course with clubs on my back. And, and then when I started working there, then the range balls were free. So until that point, I was like playing a ton because I had the membership, $50, you know, junior membership. But then once the range balls were free, I started hitting a lot of balls. Um, but I'd play a lot. And when I got to be 16, I could work there. I also got free carts. So I would take a cart. I would play with buddies, but I also play by, by, by myself. And usually it was right around 50 to 55 minutes for 18 holes on a cart if I was going like normal speed for me. And I'd park pretty much near the green and like get the ball up and down. And it was super efficient. I knew where to hit it. I knew where I'd find it. And so I got so many holes in at a rapid pace. And I think now about how, you know, so many junior golfers are out there walking and they're going slow. They're playing in foursomes. I got so many reps just going bang, bang, bang. So I'd often play, you know, 54 holes in a day on a cart and I'd be done in three, three and a half hours. And um, that was a fun way for me to kind of learn the game. Yeah, that's like a crash course into into golf. I, I think that's a mm -hmm. that's a great uh, takeaway for people too. Is that you can learn a lot more sometimes when you are playing as well uh, versus uh, just practicing. And obviously, if you can play solo too, I always loved going out solo. I don't get yeah. to do it much anymore because golf's so busy in Arizona. It is. But uh, it is fun because it's like time for yourself. You can try out different shots. Uh, it's just, you know, you and you in the course. And it, it's one of those times where I think really in my childhood, too, like that's I'd spend a lot of time on the chipping green by myself. I go play nine. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you're riding a bike for three miles, you definitely deserve getting that cart. <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's yeah, a yeah. Way to get there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think back, it really wasn't that big a deal. But uh, that's where the love of the game was. And I think so many so many people like have that experience of, um, you know, you look at expertise, like falling in love with the game. It's not a perfect swing, but man, it was fun to play. And I really enjoyed that. And I think um, as I start coaching junior golf, like I want to make sure that love doesn't go away, even though we're doing some hard mechanics at times. Mm -hmm. hundred percent. Yeah. I actually got uh, my start at a golf course too. I worked there from 14 to 18 and that's where I was I pretty much lived at. And, uh, it was yeah. nice when I turned 16, I had a car, so I was pretty much there, uh, nonstop. So I fully, mm -hmm. fully understand that love of the game. When you were in high school, then were you thinking like pro golf was pro golf was it, was that always something you were, um, looking forward to, or is that something that you just was like, Hey, I'm going to go to college and, and see where it goes. Yeah. I really wanted to be a pro. Um, so you know, kind of a late starter in, in terms of I could get the ball in the hole, but I was not a good ball striker because I had this awful steep swing. So inside of 120, I would say I was pretty close to tour good in most areas. Like I was really good wedge player, great putter, chipper. Like that was awesome. But driver off the tee was an adventure. I probably was 25 to 30 percent fairways hit as a college player. Um, maybe on my good years, like I was, you know, senior year, I maybe got up to 35, 40%, but I was never over 50% on fairways hit, but I hit a three, three fifteen. Like I was reasonably long, maybe, maybe three ten um, when I wanted to, but a lot of times I was in the trees, you know? And so, you know, how y you understand that like your environment shapes you. Well, I grew up on a really tight golf course and I could have learned to hit it straight, but I just learned to punch out really well. So that was the best part of my game was punching it out you know, elite punch out game. And so that kind of shaped, uh, shaped my game. And, but I knew that, um, you know, as I was going to play college golf, D1 play D1 coaches would look at me and they'd be like, man, this is a terrible swing. And, you know, I, I, I won the MGA junior in Minnesota, which is the, you know, amateur junior championship, but no interest because I think, uh, they probably knew and they're probably fair enough. My game maybe didn't translate to long open golf course or long tight golf courses. I was good if it was open. Um, but so, you know, I played Gustavus, uh, Adolphus is where I went to college and I had such a great experience there. I always recommend D3, unless you're like, sure, you want to play D1 and you want that to be a life like D3 is such a great way to go. Um, so I, I just had a great experience there. Definitely got better. Had a great coach, Scott Moe. Um, and when I graduated, I had definitely improved. I was still steep with my swing, but I was, I was ambitious and, and I felt like I was ready to turn pro and like, it was fun. I'm really glad I did it. it took me a, a year and a half to say, let's go teach instead. But yeah, it was, it was, it was a really good, good ride. Yeah, man. I was going to say from, you know, being 13 years old is when you got started. That's, that's kind of late so compared to some kids now, you know, Tiger was like, mm -hmm. two years old on the Michael Douglas show. I mean, so from 13 to 16 to be able to get as good as you did. And then by the time you were in uh, college and like you said, got to a plus four and that's, 
And that's what you said with you had a lot of room to improve on your swing. So hopefully everyone listening to that can just know that like you don't have to have a perfect swing to become a plus four handicap. Uh, obviously, distance sounded like a big, uh, big factor there. Were you ever getting lessons or you didn't get a single lesson until you turned to pro? I, I did have some uh, head pros that would give me some tips from time to time, but I never had a consistent lessons. And I think I regret that. Um, you know, I, I, I felt like money in our, in our, my family was like, I didn't ju- feel like I could justify going to spend 50 or hundred bucks on a golf lesson. So I just didn't even push it. And we're looking back. I really wish I would have, because if I had taken a couple of years to develop a, a golf swing, might've been a lot better, you know? So those are some regrets I have about my own game. And that probably led me towards teaching to help others as well. Like, how can I, how can I help them kind of through that? Um, but, you know, you find your own way and there's so many advantages of trying to figure this thing out. And like you said, like you can have an awful swing and still be a plus handicap. You got to have a lot of skills. And like, you know, there's, I always use the analogy, like you can measure your sort of, let's call it like your, your potential is like a glass and how big is that glass? And you look like a Victor Hovland, like that, that glass is amazingly big, right? He's got an amazing golf swing, but is he going to maximize all the potential and win 20 majors like Jack Nicholas? No, like Jack to me, the, maybe the mechanics aren't as good, but he was such a good grinder. And you look at a guy like Phil Mickelson, maybe the mechanics aren't as good, but he's going to win a lot of majors. He won six majors. So I was the guy that could fill up the glass with a lot of water, had a high skill level, but the golf swing itself was not good enough. Um, and that's how I kind of use that philosophy today. And there's different people. Like some people have an awesome swing, but just can't get the ball in the hole. And I was the guy that had an awful swing, but could get the ball in the hole. Yeah, it's it's just I, I wanted to just like talk about this, too, because it's it's such an important concept for me because people get so much in the comparison. Uh, you know, I want to have the perfect swing or what are people going to think about my swing? Uh, you know, I use this example like I'm a, I'm a plus two point five and mm-hmm. I think I have a pretty good swing. I, I don't think it's perfect by any means, but I'll post videos and people will come out of the woodworks telling me all the bad positions I'm in, all the bad things I'm doing. And I'm like, they're like, you're, this is a fake plus two. And I'll be like, this, these, my handicap is, I only play tournaments pretty much. Like these are all tournament scores, you know, and people yeah. still try to push back. So it's like this almost limiting belief that so many people have that I, there's, there's a plus two swing or there's a plus four swing. And it's like your swing obviously plays in a, a role to an extent, but at the same time, you, you can't worry about having the most aesthetically pleasing swing because you can still be a really good ball striker or a good, a good score of the golf ball. Like you mentioned, you were, you know, very steep and still plus four and, and getting on the professional golf. So I want to just like say that again for the audience because so many people just want that like perfection and swing. And I just feel like it's something you're going to work on the rest of your life, no matter how good you get. Yeah. And, and if you go online and you go look at what's out there, like the easy part is to do mechanics. Like I do a ton of lessons online and I can help somebody with the mechanics, but really what more people need is better skill practice. How do we get better at building the skills with what you have? You know, so I, I'm very segmented. And if we get into the philosophy, like I basically think there's like three different phases there. You've got to get really good at mechanics. You've got to get really good at skill development. And then you've got to get, you know, kind of cold blooded about your performance. So if you break those down, how do you master all three of those? And how do you get good at switching mindsets, which is a lot of what people struggle with? Because you, you can think about the guys on the range that probably spend all their time on mechanics and then they go to the course and they're thinking about mechanics and they hit it like garbage because they're thinking too much, right? And then there's guys that grow up like me who are just high skill level guys, but probably didn't have somebody to help them or they didn't want to improve their mechanics. Mm-hmm. And those guys are limited in how big the glass can get. They're just never going to be that great. I mean, if you're four degrees upright, you're not going to hit more than 50% of your fairways if you're super steep with your plane. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. you got to you gotta have both. Yeah, totally. No, that's that's a very, very good perspective. Obviously, we'll get into your teaching background, which is extensive as well. Uh, I had to ask a little bit about your uh, year and a half on tour because I, I read uh, one of your older posts, but it was it seemed like it was one of the more popular ones about uh, Camillo and the uh, story you had. Uh, I believe it was a story you said Camillo ruined my career, or ended my career uh, in 2005. I just thought that was a really funny story. If you could kind of tell us a little bit about that one. Yeah, it was. Uh, I was down in Florida. It was kind of I was, I was what I felt like in the middle of my getting, getting after trying to figure out if I could play for a living or not. And I'm playing the Hooters NGA tour. And as it so happened, I'd missed like several cuts in a row by a shot, you know, and Bermuda was just beating me up. It wasn't like I was hitting it awful. Um, but 
you got to learn how to putt in Bermuda, and I was just missing a couple putts here and there. So it seemed like I kept shooting even par, and the cut was negative one or whatever. So this week I get paired with uh, Camilo. I didn't know who he was. Um, we go play our first round, and he, he was he was a gentleman. He was great. Obviously, the post is obviously just trying a little bit of clickbait there, but he was awesome to play with. One thing I noticed about him was like super. You could tell his sort of like um, his mental makeup was that he was very disciplined. The cart paths being super curvy bothered the heck out of him. He wanted those cart paths to be straight. <laughs> so he kind of had a Bernard Longer sort of attitude about it. Like, you're, we're going to do things this way. And you could tell he was like on a track. So he shoots a very like unspectacular. I don't know, remember the the exact uh, score, but he was around even. But I could tell he missed a ton of putts and he hit a lot more greens than I did. So we go through two rounds of golf. And I think, I forget exactly, but I think he made the cut by one and I missed it by one or something like that. And then, you know, maybe he finishes top 20 for the week, plays pretty good on that last day. But nothing we did together made me realize that he was that much better than me, other than he hit it better than me, right? And the putts weren't falling for him. And then the next week, he shoots uh, 61, 62, 65, which I still haven't heard of anybody go lower than that. He was negative 30 for three rounds. Um, That's crazy. And, and then, you know, of course, is 7,000 yards in Florida. So it wasn't like super hard, but that's a, ridiculous score i mean if you do if you play that sort of golf you're going to pretty much win every tournament you would ever play in because that's unbelievable but uh that's when i realized like man i'm not that close because <laughs> i couldn't hit it like that you know i could scrape it around and shoot a 60 65 here and there but i wasn't going to consistently hit it that good so yeah what uh, what year did you uh turn pro or what, when when was that time yeah 2004 so you know 2004 2005 is when i was out there playing Okay. Did you try and go yeah. to Q school or was that? I wish I would have, you know, I probably uh, just need a little bit more uh, confidence in my game, but at, after, uh, after missing a bunch of cuts in a row and I made a, a little bit of money in the Dakotas tour, you know, I, I got close to breaking even. I was always kind of, I was probably too frugal. Like, you know, there was times when I just find the cheapest hotel and once in a while sleep in the car just to save some bucks. And I think I probably would do it very differently. I would have invested in coaches and fitness and um, maybe maybe just prioritize Q school is the way to do it versus playing a lot of Dakota's tour and mini tour events um, mm -hmm. to just to make money. You know, so there's different ways if you're, you're a player out there, like how you can do this. And I think I was way too cheap about it. Like you really have to invest in yourself versus trying to get out there and try to make money all the time. Yeah, I mean it, it's a it's a, such a grind out there. I mean the the mini uh, tours that they have here in Arizona. I mean even just getting into events nine hundred bucks, and I think you got to finish like yeah. top five pretty much just to make it back. Uh, and obviously you got travel, and it's an absolute grind, and it, it can um, it can definitely take it out of you. But some good things came from it. Uh, even though you weren't able to you know go as far as you wanted as a pro, uh, obviously you had uh, had a kind of an epiphany, a turning moment. So how did you get into teaching golf? Yeah, so I kind of knew all along that I'd probably end up in teaching because I was always fascinated about the golf swing, maybe because it was so hard for me. But I think I always was an engineer in terms of like understanding the physics. And like in, in college, I would help my buddies with their swings a little bit. I couldn't help myself, but, you know, I try to help them. And that was uh, that was part of the fun was like trying to figure out, you know, like <laughs> you think about all the messed up messed up teenagers that turn into great, uh, great therapists or psychologists makes sense. Right. I mean, if you got a terrible golf swing, you're going to go try to figure it out. And that's where I was driven to figure it out. So, um, I loved it right from the start and it was really natural sort of progression in my career. Yeah, that you're, you're a hundred percent right. I was an absolute head case as a kid. And, uh, that's probably why I got into the mental golf side of things. I knew <laughs> there that, you I, go. I, I knew that yeah. I needed to help some people. I think it yep. was, uh, one of my lowest moments was when I threw a five wood in a lake and I never got it back. And uh, I was like, okay, we got some anger issues. We, we probably got to work through here a little bit. So, uh, there's always, there's always room to improve and, uh, bounce back and help others. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, you've had a you've had a crazy teaching career too because i mean you've been i had you here 12 times best young teacher award you were number one teacher in minnesota you've been a, a women's golf coach for seven years uh you're you know at a country club now you have your facility like you do it all like what what is your schedule looking like how are you able to get all these lessons in and what are some of the you know maybe biggest things that uh you've learned just from working with all types of players uh from higher handicappers all the way to really skilled college players yeah, I, I think uh, I've had a nice sort of like 
I knew right away when I started teaching, I was like, I want to get really, really good at this. My goal was to be as good as anybody at teaching the game of golf. So I knew I needed a, a wide variety of experience. So in my 20s, it was about traveling, learning to teach. And then even into my 30s, like, um, you know, I went to Bhutan to coach the Bhutan national team um, and, and enjoy a totally different culture. Uh, decided By the to go. Way, get I, had a, to, I had to Google yeah. where that was when I read that. Yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. Okay, where, where, where did he go? Tell us a little bit about that. That's a cool story. Yeah, it was really a fun experience up uh, up in the you know Himalayan mountains in a country that is um, super unique. If you ever get a chance to go to Bhutan, it's really really cool. Very very different. A lot of Indian culture, but some Nepalese and sign of just Himalayan culture there. Um, and they had a funny little golf course there that was super tight. Um, and and it was just a wild experience. There was one golf course that we went to that had basically one big fairway down the middle. And then they had nine tee boxes and greens kind of surrounding it. So we had this tournament where basically like multiple people are hitting into the same fairway. It's a big fairway, but it feels like you're just hitting down to this platform. And then you hit your tee shot back up over the cliffs to a green. And we had like 45 people out there playing this nine hole golf course. That's really like two fairways or one fairway. And so the caddies should have helmets out there. Sometimes I think they did, but Basically, you'd hit your shot and then you'd yell ball as loud as you could so that everybody knew, knew to kind of duck down in the fairway. And it was like the safety was like, they just didn't care. They were just like, the odds are slim. Who cares? You know, um, but just wild experience. And, and they'd had this hole that was just wild where I remember watching this guy in front of me like he. Uh, the pin was right in the front. And if you if you rolled the ball more than six inches past the pin, it would roll off the green, but also down a mountain about 40 yards. And so this guy in front of me made a 27 and he's like a four handicap. He kept hitting it on the green and rolling it back. And like, we're just having tea and making bets uh, at the bottom of the hill. And so it was just like, just a totally different experience um, kind of going there. And, and uh, I did, uh, I talked about this a lot, but there was this kid there that was an unbelievable putter and he would basically win a lot of money just playing putting games. And he was a better putter than me. He was 10 and uh, he would, basically just hit the putt and walk right after it. There was no form at all, kind of played with an open stance. And he was an unbelievable putter. And that really got my wheels churning on like, what is skill and what is mechanics? And like, to this day, I just think mechanics for putting are kind of bullshit. Like, you just don't need that much for mechanics. Like, you need to have kind of a repeatable face. But the understanding that you need to have a perfect putter, a putting stroke is like totally misled. You need to have a repeatable sort of face control. Uh, and then most of it is, is kind of skill and feel, you know, and I think, uh, so many people just misunderstand the skill development to, that it takes to become a good putter. Um, because hitting a putt is not hard to hit it solid and controlling the face is just one part of the skill that is so important. And, uh, you know, the arc of the stroke, whether it's a little bit inside out or outside in, like that's all pretty overrated in my opinion. Um, so that got me churning on that. And then at the other end of the spectrum, I'm realizing that mechanics with the full swing matter a lot like you know all these swings on tour they look a little different at the top but a lot of them are pretty similar now near impact and so that kind of led me towards thinking about how can i study this more in depth understanding the difference between skill and mechanics and and how good is this how good does the skill need to be where you say oh now it's mechanics time let's go train that skill you know because i would argue that tiger if he'd stuck with what he had in 2000 and not changed it he would have won 25 majors i think you've messed it up you know yeah, that's uh I mean Tiger's the reason I even got into golf and obviously really? uh, Tiger Tiger Canvas right here. I grew up watching him. I'd I'd set up a TV so I had uh, a little small TV I'd play video games on for commercials and then when the golf was on I'd watch Tiger as soon as I'd go back and forth so Tiger uh yeah that hurts to think about man cuz yeah you know, we, we all call him the goat but a lot of people don't want to call him the goat cuz he doesn't have the record but yeah, right. it's hard to think. Do you think that that was injury related to though, or was he trying to avoid injuries in the future based on that swing? You're way smarter with mechanics and things like that. I think probably some of it was injuries, right? With that, with that lead knee. So am I, am I smart enough to say that it was a totally wrong move knowing that I don't know his body and how he is feeling? I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm qualified to say that, but from my viewpoint, he could have probably just softened the knee action a little bit and stuck with the kind of pivot he had because he was kind of like trail foot, lead foot. And if you imagine like he basically started out being kind of a, a two-post golfer, like it was going trail foot and front foot, right? And 
then he went through this phase where he kind kind of became a little bit more front 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 post and basically didn't tr- shift his weight as much. And now he's back to a little bit more where he used to be. So I guess I would say there was no need to ever really change that that shift pattern. And I also think like he probably put too much time into laying the club off when he was working with Haney. I don't think that club needed to get there. Like he had a pretty good plane, but there was uh, there was a problem with geometry in the game in the late '90s and early 2000s where people didn't like cross the line as much. And I think that bled into him trying to lay the club off in parallel planes. And if we go down the rabbit hole of like, who do we blame? There's nobody to blame, but Haney was teaching a lot of parallel plane stuff. Today, like Bryson's a total mechanic, but does he care if it's crossed the line? No. You know, it slots shallow enough and he can hit draws or fades from there. And I think that's what Tiger Swing looked like in 97, 98, and a little bit. In Butch's time, it was a little bit crossed, then it got a little bit more laid off. And then with with Haney, I think it didn't need to roll. I don't think he needed as much uh, form rotation to... So this is my take on it, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, obviously you have a ton of experience, so you're not getting all these uh, awards for nothing. So this is uh, this is great because I think people, you know, get so worried about laid off or, you know, in this exact position. And I like what you said about putting, too. I, I have a whole section in the book about putting, and I, I kind of talked about that, too. I feel like we overcomplicate it. And we're trying to get in all these specific positions. And you look at the best putters in the world over the years, and you're, they're, they're very different. The way they set up, open, and, mm-hmm. you know, different putters kind of, you know, jabbing at it sometimes. It's just very different. So the mechanics, it sounds like you said, were more important with the full swing, but with putting, we're just going to kind of be more feel and just get the face squares the, is the priority. Yeah, I do. I mean, I do a test with people where I have them do like a six foot putt that's pretty straight and we'll do 20 of them and we'll see how many they can make. And like most of my good high school, college and, uh, and, and, you know, pro players that I, that I coach, like they can make 18 to 20 out of that, out of that group, 18, 19 or 20 is typically what they're going to get. So at that point, like, does their stroke need that much work? I don't think so. So that, at that point we stopped doing a lot of block practice on it. You can do five, 10 minutes of, of kind of maintenance on your stroke if you want to, but now it's all about the drills, mastering speed and feel and getting better at reading them. And now if you're one of those golfers where you are literally making five out of 20, you probably need to work on your stroke a little bit. And, and there could be some time for block practice, but even if that was the case, what I would say would be do block practice with different distances while you work on your stroke as well. Not just hitting five foot putts, but go five feet, now 20 feet, now 10 feet, now 15 feet. And you also have to make sure it goes through a gate so that your face control is okay. So we're actually working yes. on multiple levels at the same time. It's not just stroke and cont- hitting your line. It's also like varying your distance and you'll actually learn a lot faster. Interesting. So you recommend for putting different distances with, uh, could you kind of break down like block practice a little bit more with putting and and maybe what that would look like if you got 30 or 45 minutes out there on the putting green? Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you want to do that stroke test, do 20 from six feet, see how repeatable that feels. But then you could basically say, all right, if I'm pretty good at that, let's go on and go ahead and do some variable practice. Block is repeating the same shot over and over. And if you feel like you have that challenge with your stroke, vary the distance a bunch as you do it. So you can work multiple levels of the skill. It's not just perfecting the stroke. They they did a study that was kind of interesting, um, shooting free throws. So if you do free throws all the time and you have one group that just does 15 footers all the time, and you have one that practices 12 feet, 15 and 18 feet, and then you go back and do a, another test at 15 feet, the 15 foot group will fail compared to the, the group that has variable. And Steph Curry says the same thing. If you want to get good at shooting three pointers, you actually need to get pretty good at shooting everywhere, which is weird, right? But yes, you could specialize in the thing you want to do, but hammering three foot putts over and over, just, it's just silly, you know? And, um, you could, you could make the argument that like that make a hundred three footers in a row is a good drill from a mental standpoint. But I would argue that if you're doing that drill, your brain's kind of turning off. And it's so unlike any skill in golf where it's so repeatedly the same thing. So you're much better off varying the distance, varying the angles, making your brain challenged. And if you want to do a drill where you're doing like, I call it more like a tornado drill where it's like you go one club length away, two club lengths away, three club lengths away, and you rotate around the hole like a clock, right? So you keep varying the distance. And if you want to do that drill and say, well, I got to do, you know, I got to make 15 out of 20 as I do that. That's fine. Add some pressure that way. 
but to to kind of go to that level of I got to make a hundred three footers in a row, I don't think there's any value there. I think it's a really silly draw. That is fan. You you nailed it, man. I I think that is perfect. I I um you know we always hear Phil talk about that, like he would do that before tournaments, and I'm like I would never tee off <laughs> because I'm my mind yeah. checks out. I'm not making a, a yeah hundred, right. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they'd be like, "Hey, Mike, you missed your tee off there." Because, oh, sorry, I was working on my three footers. All right, I like this. So we're changing the variables up with putting. I think that's mm-hmm. a lot more beneficial too, because people get bored putting it to begin mm-hmm. with, and if you're just doing the same thing over and over again, probably not going to be that likely to actually stick with it. Uh, what about mm-hmm. full swing practice? Because I know we got Rip Academy. We'll get into that in a sec. Uh, you've obviously coached. I don't even know how many thousands of lessons at this point. Uh, what are some different like uh, types of full swing practice that we could work on? Uh, you know, or what, what do you recommend? I guess I'd say the average listener is about a, a 14 handicap, uh, okay. goals to break 80 consistently. Uh, I'd say driving distance just from the surveys I've done are probably 235 to 40, maybe, you know, guys always mm-hmm. think probably hitting it farther than they are. Uh, but there's just a little bit of a background, but yeah, just what, what are some kinds of practice routines and, and how can we mix it up out there to actually get real results? Yeah. So I'm, I'm probably on the, on the far end of the spectrum in terms of like, you should probably have some dedicated mechanics time. And if you think about it logically, like let's say you got kind of a mediocre golf swing with a bunch of swing flaws. I would want you to learn how to master your swing without a golf ball in front of you, which sounds simple. And a lot of people think, oh, when I do my practice swing, it looks good. Eh, not really. Usually it doesn't. <laughs> but if you understand, this is how that practice swing really needs to look, where you're starting with your mass in the middle and you low it into the ground, you shallow the plane and you rotate, which I keep talking about in my social media. But it is, like there is a human flaw that's very common to almost every golfer. Like almost every golfer, if you stick a golfer on an island and you have them go uh, hit golf balls, they're going to come out with relatively inside takeaway, a steeper downswing, and they're going to stand up and probably flip it. Like that is the human pattern. And so oh, uh, that I makes get, me feel better because that you pretty much described. Is that your pattern? There you go. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So I, right. I train, I train people away from the average, average mistake, which is, a little bit steep, a little bit early extended, a little flippy, a little hard to time. And so everything I, I design is around that. Obviously, I can fix, you know, like simple bias patterns pretty quickly, but that is, that's the hard work you have to do. And now, if you want to develop an awesome golf swing, like go do that work and learn how to do it with what, what I call like a skill or like a transfer ladder. So I have people master the skill without a golf ball and I coach them through that process. And usually within a few hours to 10 hours, I can have that swing looking awesome. And then we transfer that skill towards a foam ball and we master with a foam ball and then we go to a real ball. And usually within a month, I can have that swing looking awesome on a real ball. And after that time, as we start to get into that, then we start really introducing kind of what I call like understanding your biases and the three main biases in golf are bad path, bad face or bad contact. And so you learn how to solve those after your mechanics are already in a pretty good spot. You know, because if you're chasing your tail around trying to hit good shots while you're doing mechanics, you can't do both. Mm. Yes. Yeah, that's uh, that's so true. And and so would you recommend uh, people? Obviously, you've you've given tons and tons of lessons. Like what's the like frequency people should be getting lessons? What's the difference between online mm-hmm. versus in person versus a D, you know, do it yourself kind of programs that are out there? Uh, I guess what's yeah. kind of your take on, you know, who's going to benefit from what and uh I guess just identifying, you know, ones, cause there's nothing worse than feeling like you took a lesson and either you're not right. committed enough or you don't feel like it goes well. Uh, there's just so much instruction out there. Everybody's, you know, teaching and there's just a lot of different methods. Uh, I guess what's kind of your take on how the average golfer can benefit from instruction the most. Yeah, I think I've, I've been just um, blown away at how successful online lessons can be. Um, and I, I, I do one-off lessons online, but I also encourage people to do like a monthly subscription. So $300 a month and I'll give unlimited lessons and they send me videos. And what, what it's actually helped me do is frame kind of the process much better. I tell them exactly where we're going to change all these swing flaws. And then I guide them through this process of how to feel each part of it, whether it's using the ground better, correcting the plane, taking care of face, path, contact, all those along that, that uh, path. And so they have a real kind of like goal in mind of, oh, I'm going to fix all these swing faults. And I think that's where when I was a young teacher, I was like, oh, I'm just going to fix one thing at a time. But the problem is like in the motor learning literature, they call this like you're in a phase or uh, alleostasis where basically everything works together, but it's all a little bit dysfunctional. 
you know, it might match. Like you might hit a little pull fade down the middle, but it's spinny and it's short. It's not what you want. Well, you need to mess up the apple cart and do a lot of things differently if you want a really different result. And so this process of doing the practice swings and understanding foam balls, foam balls are unbelievable because when you hit foam balls, you don't care about where that goes. As soon as you start hitting a real ball and you shank five in a row, how does it make you feel? It makes you feel terrible. Not good. Right? So what is your brain? You might be smart enough to say, uh, I'm working on a swing change. It's okay. But your body doesn't believe that. Your body wants to go back to the pattern you used to do. So then you get steep and you chunk it and you know, you go back to what feels comfortable to you. So the process of understanding how to use a foam ball and the learning process is like foundational to changing swing mechanics. And uh, I went to the PGA, PGA show this year and talked about it and kind of did a little survey. And less than one fourth of the instructors in the room are using a foam ball for teaching. But a foam ball is like the fastest way to learn to fix your swing. It's unbelievable because you can just focus on the video and get everything in place. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm trying to think I've got, I can't even imagine how many lessons over 25 years of playing golf and I've never, never had a foam ball with and probably had seven different people look at my swing. Yeah, I mean, and I think it's part of the reason I have the perspective I have is that I teach golf in Minnesota, where I get people that come to me in, in like November, and it's shut down, like now we got three months to go work on that. So my challenge was how do I get them to be awesome within three, four months. So I, I wasn't tied to having them hit it better immediately. Now I teach two populations, I teach like the elite players, I've got a bunch of those kids, and, and uh, like young pros. And I also teach a lot of like just country club people. And so I have to use different takes. I'm not going to get a phone ball out and just have a camp that just wants to, you know, hit it four yards longer next Tuesday. You know, that's, that's where we just work on swishing it late. Like we're not going to go break it down. So I think understanding where you're at in your process and that's where everybody has to choose. Like, do you want to break this down or do you want to just play with what you got? And then the last thing I would say is like, if you do want to break it down, you have to use the dream house analogy. And the dream house analogy is like, we're going to build the house of your dreams. It's going to be an awesome golf swing. That's going to, that's going to make it really fun to golf when you're 50, 60, 70 years old. And you're going to do this work, but we don't have to use that swing on the course yet. We're just going to build that. And so you're basically have a bifurcated swing. You have your old shitty swing, you got your new awesome swing. And when you're going to go play, just go play with your old shitty swing. At least you get what you know you're getting, right? <laughs> and that's fine. But meanwhile, we're going to learn all the tools to go use that new swing. And at a certain point, you're going to understand that your new swing is actually better than your old swing. Then you can go use it. And if you use that philosophy, it won't mess you up that much. You just got to learn to change your mindsets. Like don't use the stuff on the course yet. It might take you 10, 20 hours. Some people, it may take them 100 hours. But at least you're making progress towards something that's meaningfully better versus just like kicking it around, changing it a little bit. Yeah, I've never, I never really thought about uh, having a, a change. Of, I mean, obviously, I've you know talked about not trying to take your mechanics to the course and, and playing golf versus playing golf swing. But yeah, I like having that kind of just shifting your mindset and having like a, a double mindset kind of system. It's like, hey, we're gonna and the dream house thing. I think is a really good uh, analogy because I think people obviously want to get better. They want to hit it straighter, longer, but they they obviously want short term results, right? That's we got that mm -hmm. Amazon overnight mentality mm -hmm. and uh, and having having that. Uh, perspective and i think like you said having a coach and like a monthly subscription helps too because then you know you're working towards something together yeah exactly and um there's a it's not like it's uh there's a lot of pitfalls and a lot of things on the way but once you understand the learning process like a lot of the people i coach like i i always encourage them to be like hey i think we can get this work done in a month or two and a lot of them will, will be with me for one two three months and like luke that was great i'm ready to move on and uh, and go play golf and that's my goal like i don't I always want people to get the work done and move on. You know, it shouldn't take that long to do this work, but you just have to understand how to like really dig in and do it. And then once you're done with the work and while you're doing the work, you can still do some skill work on the side. It's not like you can't just, you don't have to not play golf for four months. You can go do 80% uh, mechanics and 20% skill work if you want to right? So it's okay to go play and you can go play golf. If your buddy invites you to go play on Friday, go play, but you just don't think about it, right? The, you know, the, the roof is not on the dream house, so we're not going to put it in play. It's not done yet. So just go enjoy your round and then get back to work when you have time. 
Yeah, no, that's that's great. I guess uh, just the last question I had for for practice and uh, and before getting into speed and ripstick is, um, what do you think about personal launch monitors? Like, should people be going out there with their own and trying to figure it out, or is that something kind of like you should work with a coach so you don't get overwhelmed with all the numbers on there? I think it's good to to know the basics. You need to know. Um, I mean, I always say path based contact are the key key biases to control. Right, you need to know what your club path is. You should be able to look at your ball flight and tell what your path is. So when I'm teaching, a lot of times I'll basically like obscure what the path number is and I'll have them hit a shot. And what you want to do is get good at looking at a shot that's relatively close to your target. And that'll tell you your path, right? Which I'm sure you know, if it doesn't curve, that's about a zero path. And if it's curving a little right to left, you're a little positive. If it's curving left to right, then you're about, you know, a little bit negative. So you keep that path in a tight range year over year. It's super important to do that. And sometimes I'll tell tell a golfer like, hey, go shallow your plane. And then pretty soon they're positive 18 on the path. That's not acceptable, right? So you have to understand the difference of like path and, and plane a little bit. Understand club path to be the number one. And then face angle would be something that a launch monitor could spit out to you. But I would say simply if the ball is going right of your target, the face is too open. If it's left, you're too close. So I never give people face angle when I'm using a track man or foresight. I never give it to them because I want it to be so simple that they could go to the range and say, oh, that ball went to the right tree. The base is open. You know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. I think attack angle is a good number that launch runners can give you. And then also um, also understanding just basically like your carry numbers, especially if you're using a good golf ball. I think if you're not using a quality golf ball, uh, then launch monitor isn't going to give you much for carry. Yeah, actually, it's funny you say that. I remember writing an article for a client about how accurate range balls are to normal balls, and yeah, it it's uh it definitely can skew the data if you're using some beat up two piece one piece balls that have uh, seen better days. And it seems like everywhere replaces them maybe maybe twice a year here in Arizona, but most likely it's once after overseed, and that's about it. Right. Right. Uh, so one of the numbers that I started focusing on when I'm, I'm not the, the biggest numbers guy. So I got a like personal, like voice caddy has like, you know, five or six kind of, uh, metrics on their launch monitor, maybe three, four years ago. And I started to obviously focus on speed. This was kind of right when the, the pandemic was going on and Bryson was doing mm-hmm. his bulk up and, you know, we were really focused on that. And I started doing a little bit of tempo training with tour tempo. And then I also, uh, started to just kind of like understand what is speed training and, mm-hmm. uh, obviously you know, the more data comes out, it's like the lower your handicap, the the longer you're going to hit it. Pretty much a direct correlation there. Um, how how did you get started with Ripstick and and helping people with speed? Because um, do you have any other training aids, or was this kind of your first uh, foray into this category? Yeah, this is that was the first one, and it was a pandemic. Like you know, suddenly like there was like one month where the pandemic started, and I was like, man, I I had forty. 40 to 50 lessons a week and suddenly it was down to five and I had to like figure out how to scramble and do some online and figure out that business model. Um, but I was like, well, I thought about this for a while because I was selling a ton of super speed, which is a great product, three different sticks. And I was like, well, I can probably make a better mousetrap here. So it was simply like taking three sticks, turning into one and finding a really simple design that actually kind of looked cool. And then we hired a aerospace engineer to make sure the sound is cool so that it swishes at the end so you can work on lag and load of the shaft and stuff like that. So we wanted to make a good tool and uh, it honestly took off faster than I expected. You know, now we have uh, a bunch of employees and it's, it's going, going pretty well. Um, and we've had a really meaningful impact in terms of the results have been good too, you know, cause I want to stand by it and we've sold over 15,000, probably, probably 20 actually now as I think about it. And uh, we make this guarantee of 20 yards. If you don't gain 20 yards in three months, we'll give you your money back. We've had less than five takers on it. And so that's an easy promise. Like, all you got to do is follow the plan, do the app, send us an email and say, hey, Luke, it didn't work. I'll give you your money back. You know, it's so easy. And if you think about like going to the gym, like if I said, all you got to do is go to go to the gym for 45 minutes once a week, Michael, and I will guarantee you 20 yards, you could probably do it, right? So 100%. it's really not that big a commitment for a lot of people. And then the last thing I would say is if you if you maybe work with a pro or you send us a video, because we do a free swing analysis. I personally do it for anybody that buys one. And it doesn't take me that much time to give you two, three minutes to kind of something to watch. Be like, all right, watch getting steep or watch your kind of linear trace or your rotation. That way you have a guiding principle while you're training along with the videos that we that we send. That way your swing's not getting worse as you're getting faster. 
Because that there's a huge myth that you can just swing as hard as you want and you're going to get better at golf. Sometimes the sequence gets a lot better. Sometimes it gets a little worse. Most of the time, like people's sequence gets better, but their path may get weird or the face might get weird. So you have to make sure that although you're going to benefit from a better sequence, you're going to have that kinematic sequence improving and lower body's usually firing and you're getting better separation. All those things are going to improve. You have to clean up those other things. And that's where the other part of the training comes in is like, Work on your swing while you gain speed. And I will I will guarantee you won't gain quite as much speed right away, but you'll keep the ball in play while you do it, which I think is a really important selling point. Yeah, well, I mean, so many things there. Uh, first off, congratulations. 20,000 of anything is a, is a ton of sales. Uh, that's a lot of golfers hitting it a lot longer. So congrats on that. That's super cool. Um, you, you guys sent me one. And the first thing I said, I was like, when I was unwrapping, I was like, this thing just feels, it looks good. It feels good. I love the, love the swoosh. Like you said, it just, it had a different feel than super speed than, uh, the stack. And I, and I like that it's the length of a driver. Why are you the only mm-hmm. one that has, uh, a super or clubs that are d- the same length as a driver? Everyone else's are what, like a seven or five iron. I don't know the, why aren't they the same? I've never quite understood that. I don't know. I mean, I think, I think you can do some good work with a shorter driver, but if you were imagine like, you know, go, go to motor learning example, like let's say we're playing with a driver that's eight feet long and you're trying to swing a two foot long driver the whole loading pattern is different. How you use your wrists, everything about it is different. Um, So you're probably better off training with the tool that you're actually swinging Um, because your wrists and the hand action is all a little bit different. So I think that's one selling point for sure. You got to, there's advantages of playing with the right, right length. And it's super convenient having it as one club too. And I love the head cover you guys have. I've yet to see anyone else have that. So <laughs> I like I, I like the little swag that you guys have there. I think that helps too. You you see a fellow rippers at the range now, and you just kind of give the the head nod. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think think that's really cool. Um, and and the fact like anyone can use it, right? Can you talk a little bit about like who should be using it? I know you guys have different models. You have indoor, outdoor. Maybe just explain uh, yeah. a little bit more of of how ripstick works. I've talked about speed training quite a bit, but you know, for those new listeners or maybe people that haven't experiment uh yet with it like who should be using it and uh what's like the frequency and and to get those kind of results that you're talking about yeah so we have a great app now that uh will kind of guide you through the training the app's free and it basically the idea is you're going to train three days a week it's going to get keep track your progress as you go we have a radar that's actually actually out We're, we're like dropping it very very soon and it will track your your results and bluetooth right to the app so you don't have to do anything or talk or anything um, and it will guide you through the training. And then we're already working on kind of customizing the plans a little bit more so that it kind of targets you. We already know a lot. And that's where like, you know, again, if you send in a swing for a swing analysis, I'll give you some tips that will help you for sure. But the training plans are going to get more and more specific and get better and better. Um, but it's super easy. It fits for anybody. Like if you're an older golfer trying to pick up speed, um, it's awesome. Like, if, if you're a younger golfer, like, and you already have an awesome rocking kinematic sequence, you may need to just gain a little strength, but I would still say like gain speed if you can, you know, like always, always keep tapping the speed thing because at a certain point, um, mechanics will only go so far. If you don't bang the ball out there, if you can't reach par fives and two, it's very, very hard to be competitive at this game. Yeah, no, I think that that's uh, just so key. It's just like I, I used to hit it when I was, t- like I said, in, in high school, I was terrible. I was sitting at 170, 180. I was like not even five feet tall. Now I hit it, you know, close yeah. to 100 yards longer. Like golf, golf's a lot easier uh, yeah. when, you're, when you're able to do that. And what I love about speed training is that, like you said, it's not like taking hours and hours out of your day. You're not having to go to the gym and hire a trainer and be there you know, five days a week, like 15, 20 minutes, three times a week. And you get you get super fast results. And I think kind of you get like, if you go to a gym, you kind of get those newbie gains as well. I feel like you really right. start to see that. And then you go to the golf course and all your friends are like, what, what, what happened? Like, it, it's pretty impressive how, how fast it all works. Right. Yeah. And, and certainly like you can just do some driver swings at home without using this overload or underload principle and you'll have gains like that will work. But the science of kind of switching the weight is really powerful because when you go heavier, it actually increases your stretch factor or like your disassociation. Cause when you go heavier, it's heavy and your lower body is going to fire and your upper body can't catch up immediately, which makes your lower body kind of lead better. So it improves your sequencing when you go heavier. And when you go lighter, 
you're basically just, it's, it's the whole idea is you're teaching your brain to go faster, which is why sprinters run downhill, that why they use parachutes um, to slow you down. So it's really valuable training going heavier and lighter. Almost every major league pitcher in their development now will, will kind of throw with heavier and lighter balls, learning how to basically stress the sequence. And as long as you don't go too heavy or too light, that range of something like 20% lighter and 20% fast, uh, heavier is very, very powerful for gaining more speed. Interesting, man. You've had so many new ideas. I've never even thought about it. I love it. This is, uh, this is fun. I, yeah, I never, never would have thought about that. And what about the uh, counterweight too? I noticed that when I was, uh, first took it out, I didn't notice that in any of the other speed training devices. What's the, uh, uh, logic behind that and how does that help? I like the counterweight. We put that in because, uh, my experience, especially using super speed was that, especially when you go heavy, it's, uh, or, I'm sorry, when you go heavy and you don't have a counterweight, it's really, really, um, a lot of swing weight meaning it feels really head heavy. And then as a result, it kind of, it kind of whips harder at the bottom. And you're, I would, I would, I would argue that your chance of a wrist injury is increased if the release is a lot more violent. And so for me, because I fight some tendonitis, I was like, one thing I can do to help with that is to balance out the weight of the thing and to put that counterweight on there. So it's a 60 gram counterweight. You can take it off if you want to, but I think it probably does a better job of balancing out the swing. So I leave it on there all the time. And a lot of people that we've talked to really like that. Cool. Yeah. And I like how you guys have different sets. You have one, I think for juniors, one for seniors, you have an indoor, you have an outdoor. So you have a lot of different models to really fit uh, all the different uh, types of golfers out there. Uh, before getting mm-hmm. into my last few questions, uh, tell us a little bit more about Rip Academy. I love following all the stuff. Uh, if you guys aren't following Luke, again, make sure you do. I'll link to it down uh, in the show notes, but your Instagram is amazing. You have a ton of content on there. Seems like you're working with really good junior players all the time. Um, and that, uh, you know, how did that all start? Uh, I know that uh, Ripstick was 2020. When did you get started with Rip Academy? Rip Academy started uh, this year, 20, 2024. And our idea was just to get, because uh, I coach a lot of a lot of good players locally, but it was nice to get them together and kind of form a community and start to use some of the principles that we've been talking about in the training, which are speed and kinematics and understanding uh, how, to, how to train in different phases. So we're doing mechanics phases, we're doing skill fa- uh, training. So it was to me like, a good chance to put all the stuff that I've used into a system and go apply it in a nice indoor setting. And I'll be honest, like the first month we're open, we got like 60 high school kids in there and we had just a ton of messed up swings. And I was like, can this all work in a group setting? Cause I'm so used to coaching individually, but we have three instructors there and, you know, group of 10. So two or three instructors, and we're just walking around and helping kids and talking about core concepts too. But now we're to the point where like the swings are all looking pretty good. We're a couple months in and the model of coaching is great because like Michael, you know, you think if you go to a lesson, like how many things you actually need to go work on in one lesson. It's probably a few things, right? And we can give you the drills and kind of the blueprint there. And then you need touch-ups to make sure if it goes this way or this way, how do you correct it? And so it's more of an iterative process where um, you don't need to see your, your coach necessarily every week. Um, in an individual lesson, you can do group lessons and, and it's been really fun to put that into action. Then we integrate some speed training and fitness as well. So that kind of feels pretty holistic. So it's been really fun because in Minnesota, it's all, it's all winter training. It's, uh, we're not going to be out on the golf course generally very much. Man, I wish I had that in high school. Just the the group mentality, the fitness. I needed some help there. Spent a little too much time in McDonald's and Taco Bell. Yeah, we, <laughs> we, 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 you're doing a you're doing a ton for junior golfers. Are your kids already uh, speed training, or, or how's that all looking? My my own kids, my personal kids. Yeah. So I've got a six year old and an eight year old, and we'll get out there and get the radar going once in a while. But my um, you know, we usually do about ten swings is enough for them, and they're just trying to you know, my eight year old, he can swing it. He's already in the kind of mid sixties club head speed, um, you know, awesome. and my, my, uh, six year old hits little draws that are 120 yards right down the middle. But I am a big believer in like create well-rounded athletes and, and don't push the golf, just make sure that's fun. And I think if you can get them into golf at a young age, that's a cool, really cool thing, but just get them, you know, we did a, a ton of balloons when they were young and they're the, the hand eye development is so key being able to whack stuff and throw hard. If you can jump, jump pretty far, you can throw hard and you can run fast. You can always teach golf pretty well. And in those kind of years to really develop great mechanics are with, with a junior golfer are kind of like age 10 to 15 is that sweet spot to really hammer mechanics. And as adults, you can just keep doing it obviously forever. But if you do it at a young age, the cool thing about doing all those mechanics at a young age is that 
the pattern that you're going to get under pressure is the pattern that their swing is because they've molded over time and they don't have to revert to an old pattern. You know, so like when I was a kid, I'd hit hooks. And so I practice fades and then I go play a state open and I hit draws. Right. And it, we have, we all have these patterns that are transfer patterns that are hard to change. And the advantage of getting, uh, you know, if you have kids, like get them some good instruction so that they don't have the patterns that you're fighting as an adult. Yeah, man, that's, that's so cool. I feel like you're setting up a, a great foundation for for kids to really uh, succeed in the long run. I know golf is just getting more and more competitive at a younger age. So it sounds like Rip Academy is uh, a great training ground for them. What's, uh, mm -hmm. before the last question, what's the uh, best place for everyone to follow you, connect with you? As I mentioned, your Instagram's amazing. Are you anywhere else or what's the best place uh, people can keep up to date with your stuff? Yeah, find me on Instagram, Dr. Luke Benoit. And uh, we're going to try to do you know, a little bit more education. Like originally, like the idea was build the build Instagram following and make it a little more clickbaity. Uh, obviously, like I want to always have great information, but as you know, like if it if if the algorithm sees something less than ten seconds, it probably likes it better. But we're going to add more content and get a little bit deeper with it. And then, if you're interested in doing lessons, uh, look me up on Skillist. You can find me there, uh, or you can DM me for lessons as well. Um, and, and try try out a month or two of s subscription to work on the mechanics. Perfect. Awesome. Well, I know you have, like I said, so much experience in all aspects of the game, teaching, playing at a high level. Uh, a lot of my listeners are getting into tournaments. They're wanting to get into their first member member, maybe their first state association event. Uh, so for my last question, what would you recommend is maybe something that uh, what's like the best tip you think that uh, can help them in uh, competition and under pressure to uh, help them play a little bit better? Yeah, I think the number one thing is like, um, just be okay with uh, uh, kind of like the difficulty of the game and the timelines. And like with my junior golfers, like one mental game discussion we always have is like, pretend you're 80, you're 80 years old and you're looking back at yourself. And an 80 year old self looking back will probably say, maybe don't stress out about this as much. Just try to enjoy the experience and grow. And that perspective can always be very helpful. And I think a lot of time we, we expect success to be li linear and going forward. But of course, it's, it's filled with up and downs. And I think um, as you age, you need to get better at that. And look at it as more of curiosity when things go bad versus um, frustration. Because you can get curious or you can get angry. And it's probably easier and more successful to be curious. Like, what can you learn from it versus, you know, it's a growth mindset, isn't it? That's a fantastic answer. I mean, that's like a mic drop answer right there. So thank you for uh, for sharing that. I had a coach say something similar. He said, get curious, not furious. And I, I've yeah, uh, I do that's always, great. always remember that it's it's easier said than done after you hit a bad it shot, is. but it's a uh, it's good perspective. And thank you so much for being a guest on Wicked Smart Golf. You shared a ton of knowledge. I'll link to everything down in the uh, show notes. And I'm confident that everyone listening is going to be wicked smart after listening. So thank you again. Awesome, Michael. It's a great show. Love how you do it. Thanks for having me on.